and we'll be looking at 16 through 24 in a few minutes. Uh, I want to say a few other things before we get started, but before we do any of that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we thank you so much for the blessings that we've already received from being here in your house. Now as we go into the time of your word, pray your speech into our hearts as you see fit, Lord. May it convict us, motivate us, change us, whatever you have fit for us, Lord. Uh, speak into our hearts, Father. Meet with us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Oh, yeah. Remind me at the end. I got something special to tell you about all, all the way. Just don't let me get out of here and without telling you about uh, uh, something that I have for you all, okay? So uh, just don't let me forget. We'll get all the way to the end. I haven't done anything that's unusual. So mind me. All right. But this week, have you been watching D-Day stuff this week? You've seen it on TV. You've seen it everywhere. Um, you know, I have, I've been absorbing it. Of course, I, I like history and I like military stuff, you know, and I've, I've grown up watching uh, all this military stuff. Uh, you know, my, my dad always told mom that he had to watch all the history of the war documentary. He said one day it might end differently. He would need to know. <laughs> so, so, so that's why we watch it. You know, if you paid attention to the History Channel for the past 75 years, then you know that the D-Day invasion of Normandy was a success. Right? They, they achieved the objective that they set out to. Okay? But um, if you're not a history person, however, then you may not know about all the things that went wrong that day. Not everything went as planned in that great big invasion that they staged on that day. I'm going to tell you about some of those things. Okay? And i got a point for this. I'll, I'll, I'll tie into my message. But for instance, the, the very first people to go in in the invasion uh, were uh, approximately 300 paratroopers known as the Pathfinders. All right? Now what these guys' job was, they were gonna, they were gonna parachute in about midnight into, uh, into Normandy, into German-held territory, okay? And they were gonna uh, go in and they were gonna secure the landing areas for all the other paratroopers that were coming in. And they had, they had electronic beacons and they had lights to set up to mark the places where everybody else was going to come in the land. Right? And they were going in by themselves. Now, they got there on time, but that's about the only thing with them that went right that night. Because the, the clouds were so bad, the weather was, was, was bad, and the clouds were low. So the planes had to fly low under the clouds. And that made them easy picking for the anti-aircraft guns that were on the ground that were just tearing them up all over the place. All right, So, so they, uh, they were getting shot up. And, and also... They didn't know when they jumped. I just learned this watching this stuff this year, that the Germans had flooded the area where they were going to jump into. Uh, and, and when they jumped, they didn't know that they would be jumping into flooded fields full of water. And a lot of those guys, uh, they, they jumped in there and actually drowned in the fields that they jumped into because the water was so deep. And they lost the beacons and they lost the lights and they got damaged in the water and they didn't work. Uh, and so only a few of the teams of these 300 men were, were able to actually set up their beacon and the, and the, uh, and the lights, okay? So things were going on right off the bat. About an hour later after the Pathfinders landed though, the planes carrying uh, over 12,000 paratroopers arrived to, to drop their people in. Now, due to the weather, Due to the anti-aircraft fire and due to the lack of beacons that, that they expected to be there when they got there, uh, the troops fell all over the place. They were scattered all, you know, they were supposed to be in specific areas and they, and they landed just all over. Uh, some of them, even at least one plane load, actually jumped out over the English Channel. And of course, those guys drowned when they hit the water because they, they weren't expected to jump out over the water. Um, so things were going wrong around the bat. But those troops got on the ground and, and then as dawn broke things kept going wrong. I mean, well, over over 5,000 ships were amassed out there in the English Channel waiting to deliver over 150,000 troops that would be coming in. All right, and, and they knew that the Germans had heavy defenses out there just off the beach. We're watching this, this area, right? So for 45 minutes before the troops started to go in the Navy pounded the ground out there with everything they had. They were just shelling and shelling and shelling. And they, they hoped 
to soften up the, the defenses enough to allow the men to get into the shore without being slaughtered. But you've seen the documentaries, you've seen the movies, it wasn't enough. As the ramps dropped on those Higgins boats, bringing those men to shore, many of them were killed instantly. As soon as the ramp went down, the machine guns were tearing them apart. And many of them drowned when they jumped off because they, the boats couldn't make it far enough in and they were in deep water and they had the heavy load of all their equipment and they jumped in and, and they didn't make it. They even had, they had special tanks outfitted that were that had uh, that were supposed to float in there and go up on shore. And, and because the water was so rough, the tanks were sinking. So, so that didn't work. Things were going wrong. Oh, and look, 4,000... 413 died that day, soldiers of the day. Most of them never making it off of that beach. So things, things went wrong. You know the rest of the story. The remaining soldiers, they rallied up and they fought on. They secured the objective. You know, and, and thank God they did because if they didn't, things might have turned out way different. All right? uh, the, the whole world may have been different. The reason that they fought so hard it was because D-Day had to happen. There was failure was not an option. They had to get there. If the Allies were going to stop Hitler from keeping on advancing and eventually going on to try to take over the whole world, which was going to be his eventual objective, the armies had to get there. And they did. Thank God they did. Right? It may not have been as planned, but they did what they had to do because it had to happen. And I say all this to say this, it reminds me that in our life, things don't always go the way we plan it, does it? Things, things go crazy. So even, even things that encompass our walk with Christ don't go as planned. Can I get an amen? We, we would probably, many of us would say that they usually don't go as planned. Now that could be that could be bad, it can turn out good, you know, but, but things don't go as planned. Things in our families don't go as planned. Things in our household don't go as planned. Things in our church don't go as planned. It's a fact. Things happen. Look, if there's a theme to the message this morning that I want to tell you is don't panic when things don't go as planned. Alright? It's gonna happen. And there are some reasons why. Let's talk about the reasons why things don't go as planned. Uh, sometimes. Number one, sometimes God changes the plan. You ever, you ever been there? And my motto, if, you, if, I, if I had a motto to put on, on, on myself, and you've probably heard me say this before, and you'll hear it again and again. My motto is it's smart to have a plan, and it's wise to know that God can change that plan anytime he wants to. Even if it's in the beginning, even if it's in the end. Have a plan, but know that God can change it. And it often happens, doesn't it? As we're, we're working towards an objective, something that God has laid on our heart that we feel like is something to do, and, and then God redirects our path. Because he knew the objective wasn't what he had us going for in the first place. He needed to get us into one place so that he could get us into another place. And God does that. He changes the plan. He's God. He can do that. Right? He knows how the plan is going to come. And it can be unnerving to us sometimes, can't it? When God does that, but God knows why, and He'll work that out. And so God should just have faith in it. But so sometimes God changes the plan, but sometimes, sometimes it's our fault that the plan changes. You give people enough time, we'll break stuff, right? We will get stuff wrong, and we will, we will, we will fall. It. Well, due to fallenness of mankind. Our sinfulness, we tend to mess things up. Don't we? It's just a fact. We do. Our careers, our marriages, our commitment to God, we, we get things wrong. And sometimes, sometimes we make a little dent. Sometimes we destroy things. But we mess up plans sometimes. We have to be hyper aware to follow God, to rely on Him, and lean not on our own understanding. Because He's the one that's going to lead us in the right way. So sometimes God changes the plan. Sometimes it's our own fault. And the third thing I want to show you is that sometimes other people in our plan don't cooperate. You know, you know maybe that's, that could actually maybe be our first, um, our, our first, it shouldn't be probably, but it's our first option sometimes when we want to put the blame 
when our plan doesn't go, well, it's because so-and-so didn't do their part. You know, they didn't do what I expected them to do, and that messed my plan up. Well, a lot of times that's actually the case. All right? Um, one thing you cannot do is control another person. You might think you can for a while, but you can't. People have their own mind, and they're going to do their own thing, and we can't control them. One thing that God does not usually do is make someone do something that they don't want to do. Did you catch that? God does not usually make someone do something they do not want to do. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to say unequivocally that God cannot because God can do whatever he wants to. But God usually does not mess with people's decisions. And there's some things that God will not mess with the decision on. A prime example of that is salvation. I'm going to accept Jesus Christ. If someone chooses to accept Jesus Christ, they made the choice to do that. The opposite side of that coin is choosing to reject Christ. Because anybody who does not choose to accept chooses to reject. There's no, there's no not making a choice. All right? And if someone chooses to reject God, God will not override that decision. He will not. Now, this can be so frustrating for us, can as, as we try to reach people in our lives for Christ, we try, to, we try to witness to people in our families and people in our job places and people that we come in contact with and we try over and over, but they will not respond. And it frustrates us. And it's frustrating as we try to build a church and, and we want to see this place full of people. Not so that we can brag and say we have a church full of people, but because we care and we want to minister to people and we want to deliver the gospel to people and we want to disciple and we want to see people grow and get stronger in their relationship. And, and it's frustrating when people in today's society are seemingly not even concerned with being here. And I'm not even intentionally stepping on congregational toes. Don't get me wrong this morning. I'm, I, you're, you're here. Amen. I'm glad you're here. I mean, as we try to get more people from outside so that we can help them grow. I mean, the world just seems unconcerned. Look, any time that our plans don't go as planned, it causes a disruption, doesn't it? It's a disruption to the plan. The question is, what do we do about it? Will it derail us, or will we just find another plan and carry on? Look, let me make this statement, and I'll, and I'll say this. If it happens to God, it can happen to us. Did you know that God's plans get disrupted? Have you thought about that for a minute? It's not a real fair comparison between God and us, because we know that God, in his foreknowledge, knows when the plan will break and already has a contingency plan in place and knows how that one will come out. But indeed, the things that God has planned... We interrupt sometimes. And, and mankind that, that he created doesn't do what God planned them to do. Now, there's an example in the Bible that we'll look at here in a minute. Luke chapter 14. Uh, in, in the Bible where Jesus uses a parable to describe a plan that God had. All right? But the people in the plan wouldn't cooperate. We'll see that in just a minute. But it rings real reminiscent of what we go through trying to bring the gospel to the world and trying to bring the world into the church. And we're going to see those comparisons here in just a minute. But let's read our scriptures. If you turn there already, it's Luke chapter 14, 16 through 24. Let's look at this parable that, that Jesus tells. And then we'll, uh, we'll give a set to it in just a minute. Verse 16 says, Then said he unto them, A certain man made a great supper and bade him in, and sent a servant at supper time to say, to them that were bidden, come, for all things are now ready. And they all, with one consent, began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I've married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant said, and showed, uh, he came and showed to his Lord these things. Then the master of the house became, uh, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and, and bring in the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done 
as thou hast commanded, and yet there's room. And the Lord said to the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Now the setting here, if you, if you, so we'll know what's going on here. Jesus is actually eating on the Sabbath day at a Pharisee's house. So he's at the home of a Pharisee. And as you read Luke chapter 14, it really seems like he's trying to teach these folks a lesson in humbleness. Because they were not. These were not humble guys. And he's telling them back in verse 14, if you look there, not to do things that you do so that you can receive a reward. He says to wait for the reward at the resurrection. Now look in verse 15 at the completely unhumble response that one of them gives him. He says, and when, one, uh, and when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. He probably said it just like that. Now I feel sure that this guy didn't get it. But with the parable, Jesus pretty much tells them, you're not going to be there. You see, these, these Pharisees were the religious elite of the Jews. We know all about their story. Now, and Jesus, who was a Jew, went to the Jews with the gospel first, did he not? It was to the Jew first and then to the Greek, the Bible says. All right, so he goes to them first. And the Bible says he went to his own, but his own received him not. See, the plan was, the plan was all along for the Redeemer, Jesus, to come to the Jews. And they should have recognized him for what he was. They should have seen that this is the Messiah and accepted him and he was going to, to, to pay the debt for their sin. But they didn't want a Messiah right then. They didn't want that kind of Messiah right then. So by and large, they rejected. The gospel was then delivered to the Gentiles. Now, of course, none of this came as a surprise to God. Of course, he knew how that was going to work out the whole time. It was all planned out in his mind. He knew that they would reject his plan. And now here we are 2,000 years later. We're the ones delivering the gospel, and the majority still reject the plan. Now, I'm sure that it's no accident that the excuses that these characters in the parable gave are so eerily similar to the excuses that people still use today. Let's look brief at that. Uh, well, we don't have to spend a lot of time on it, but I want to show you that this word is still relevant today. What was, what was happening 2,000 years ago and the words that were wrote in this living word of God still apply to us and to everybody else because the world still acts just like it did so long ago. Now, none of these things would have prevented the guests from coming to the meal in the parable, right? Uh, the point is, they put their importance over the meal to, to stick with the parable. They put the, the importance of the things that they had, the excuses they had, over being at the meal that the, the master of the feast had prepared. Now, one of two things is going on here, and neither one of them is right, okay? Either... They really believe that the excuse was more important than being there, or more likely, they didn't want to go to the meal, and the excuses provided them a way out. Doesn't that sound familiar? Now, let's look at what they said. Verse 18, we'll go back there and look at it. When he said, uh, and they all who wanted consent began to make excuses. The first said unto them, I bought a piece of ground, and I must need to go and see it. Pray that he had me excused. This, this first guy had a new possession. He had, he had a fiend. A fiend that kept him from coming. What a silly excuse. What, where was his land going to go anyway? Was it, it, was, it was his land. It would have still been there when he got through eating the meal, right? Look, there's no end to the list of things that keep people from coming to Jesus, is there? There's no end. We, 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 we keep coming up with stuff. Uh, and Jesus told a rich young ruler one time in the, in the Bible, he said, go and sell everything you have and come and follow me. Now, he knew that guy wouldn't do it. He knew he wouldn't do it when he said it because 
he loved the things too much to let them go. You know, it doesn't have to be an object like a piece of land. It doesn't have to be uh, something that we can put our hands on. Most of the time, it's a deeply ingrained sin habit of some sort that people will not turn loose on to come to Christ. And they're afraid if I come if I come to Christ, if I start coming to church and I get all religious and get involved in this, then I can't do these things that I enjoy doing. So the excuses are still the same. Look at verse 19. And another said, I bought five yoke of oxen and I go to prove them. I pray that you have me excused. This guy had an investment. He had something. Oxen were work animals. All right? This was they were used to make money. Now they were his oxen. They weren't going anywhere. He would not lose one day's earnings to attend the meal that the master of the feast had provided. You know, in the book of 1 Timothy, Paul says the love of money is the root of all evil. Didn't he? And Jesus himself one time said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Y'all look. If I had a dollar for every time I heard somebody say churches are just out to get your money, then I'd be rich and probably not here. <laughs> so thank God I'm not rich. Because knowing what I know now, I could not trade it for anything. But the world doesn't see it that way. Look, verse 20. This guy, this is the, the king of all excuses here. Another said, I have married a wife. And therefore, I cannot come. Every married man knows when you get married, you stop going to your single friend's party. Maybe this guy was single and he just couldn't go, right? And sometimes you go ahead and sell your boat and all your other toys. Because there's something more important to you now. You thought I was going the wrong way with that. No, I'm just kidding around. But look, I can firmly say if there's somewhere that my wife is not welcome, I don't want to be there. I don't want to go. That's not the problem with this guy, though. He's just making an excuse. But it reminds us of the thing, doesn't it? It reminds us that the people in our lives can bring us closer to Christ or they can push us away. It reminds us that we're supposed to bring others to him, are we not? We're supposed to be out there getting others and bring them to him, but those that we love, and if we if they won't come, we have to go anyway. I was just talking to a, a, a friend of mine just a while back, and he said he'd been wanting to come to church. He was trying to get his wife to come, and she just wouldn't come. I said, man, look, I, I, I wish she'd come with you, but if she won't come, come anyway. You know, it's a sad state, but sometimes you have to do that. Sometimes people hold you back. Too many people stay away from the Lord. They stay out of church because the people that they love are holding back. Now, the master of this feast got frustrated. Didn't he? he got angry because, and he sent his servants out to get those who had no excuse. It was like he said, go out there and get people that are hungry and bring them in to my feast. Go out there and get people that were so low they were hurt. And they would come in and appreciate it. You see, the ones on the guest list, they had their own food. They need the master of the beast food. Now let's take a minute and let's apply this to ourselves. We get frustrated sometimes. And we feel like the master of the feast must have felt sometimes, don't we? See, we know, we know how important it is to, to know Jesus as your personal Savior. We know the joy of being a part of a functioning church body. And we know the frustration when people that we care about don't take it seriously. So what do we do? What do we do? Number one, don't give up. Don't, don't, don't stop. See, in this parable, we've got to keep it in context here. Jesus is kind of taking a slap at the arrogant Pharisees. All right? So... Now, the gospel went first to the Jews, and most of the Jews rejected them. But, but did any of the Jews believe in Jesus and follow him? Yes, they did. All the, the apostles were Jewish. The vast majority of the early church was Jewish people. 
All right, so they did come. Now, I told you that to tell you this. See, the door was open for anyone to follow Jesus. And many did. And the door is still open for anyone to follow Jesus. And many will. But what if the master of the feast would have stopped with just those that he invited? What if he would have stopped right there? What if, a, and, and just say, you know, I'm going to just wait and, and, and see who will, will, will trickle in. What about the poor and the maimed and the hall and the blind that went in? What if there was a meal and they were welcome to come in and enjoy, but nobody went out to tell them? You know what, in case you haven't caught this yet, we're the servants. We're the ones that go out and tell. And God has already issued the open invitation for everybody to come. Everybody is welcome at his table. And people are all around us who are hungry and hurting. They won't just wander in. We have to get the word out to them. What if some of those hungry people, though, aren't the ones that would be our first choice? Having sitting next to us on Sunday. You know what I mean? You see, these, these people here, these folks that came to the feast, they were not the ones that sophisticated, clean people would normally want to share a table with. What if, what if those people come to our church? Well, look, I cannot imagine me being Christ's first choice to die for. But praise God, he did it anyway. I believe that if I was the only one who would ever accept him, and praise God, he loves me so much that he would have went to that cross just for me. The invitation is open. Everybody. If our musicians would go ahead and be making their way to the front, I got to tell you one more thing. You see, when, when the supper was ready and the guests didn't come, the master told the servants, he said, go out quickly and get them. Go out quickly. Why was he in such a hurry? Look, what happens to supper once it's on the table? It doesn't stay hot forever, does it? Soon the food would begin to spoil and the meal time would be over. And the opportunity would be lost. I say this to anybody that hears my voice and has not yet accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You have been invited. It's free. It's good. It's eternally fulfilling. But it will not be available forever. You have to come in. And it's best to do it now while the invitation is open because one day the door will close and it will never be open for you again. Let's stand together. We're done with the team.